हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू लेक्चर थर्टी वन ऑफ दिस कोर्स इन द लास्ट लेक्चर आई स्टार्टेड डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एन एम आर एंड इट्स प्रिंसिपल इन दिस लेक्चर आई विल डिस्कस अबाउट हाउ टू प्रोसेस द एन एम आर डाटा देन वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट केमिकल शिफ्ट एंड द फैक्टर्स अफेक्टिंग केमिकल शिफ्ट इन द लास्ट लेक्चर आई शोड यू दैट सिग्नल in nmr is given by this equation s at a given time is equal to s not multiplied by exponential i and this is capital omega which is basically chemical shift multiplied by time multiplied by exponential minus r2 into t r2 into t so this is this signal is called free induction decay and it will look like this if i plot s versus t it will look like this this is known as free induction decay or fid and it is basically a time domain signal time domain signal so in nmr we generally start with time domain signal because that way we can maximize the sensitivity you must remember that nmr is low sensitive technique because the gap between ground state and excited state is very low and that means that population difference between two states are quite small population difference between two state is quite small and hence the sensitivity is low so one of the thing which we do is to get the signal in time domain and then do fourier transformation so if we do fourier transformation of the fid what we are going to get is two different peaks which is one is called absorption and the second is dispersion so if we take fourier transformation of this signal what we are going to get is a which is a function of omega is equal to r divided by r square plus omega minus capital omega square whereas d omega is given by minus omega minus capital omega divided by r square plus omega minus capital omega square so this is your absorption and this is your dispersion and they have lorentzian uh, line shape absorption line shape is always positive whereas dispersion line shape has positive and negative part positive and negative part now some important facts about uh, absorption and dispersion peaks that if you take height at height of the peak at omega is equal to capital omega then s omega will be 1 by r and you can do it here so if i take omega is capital omega then this part is going to be 0 and so a omega is r divided by r square which is 1 by r so and uh, the second thing is if i take s omega is equal to 1 by 2r so in that case a omega is 1 by 2r and this is equal to r divided by r square plus omega minus capital omega square and so what does that means is 2r square is equal to r square plus omega minus capital omega square so r square is equal to omega minus capital omega square so r is equal to plus minus omega minus capital omega and what does that mean is omega is will be equal to omega will be equal to capital omega plus r and or capital omega minus r capital omega minus r and so the difference so if you remember that peak looks like this so this height is 1 by r and that's what is written 1 by r 
because at this point omega is equal to capital omega and if I take this omega half it means at the half height um, where signal is equal to 1 by 2 r. So, th this is 1 by r. So, this will be 1 by 2 r. So, this this value is given as omega minus r and this value will be capital omega plus r and so difference between these is 2 r. So, width at half height half height means when signal is 1 by 2 r then width at half height is this width is your this plus omega plus r minus this minus minus plus r. So, this cancels out. So, this is equal to 2 r. So, equal to 2 r. So, this is characteristic of absorption and dispersion peak. Now, let us think about that if we take a small uh, some molecule which is a complex molecule, it is going to have various types of protons. Hence, F i d will be super position of various frequency and each having a different decay rate. Okay, so, now question is we have to apply pulse at one time. Suppose, I am applying 90 degree pulse to get a 1 day spectra and which kind of pulse we should use because there are several resonances in NMR spectrum of a molecule with different Larmor frequency and it is not possible to be on resonance with all the lines. So, we have to choose a transmitter, a transmitter frequency such that we are affecting all the resonance at the same time. So, if you are looking at proton spectrum, it covers about 10 ppm, it goes from 0 to 10 ppm. So, in that case transmitter frequency is generally put at 5 ppm, thus the maximum offset is 5 ppm on both sides. So, 0 to 10 ppm, suppose this is your NMR spectral region. So, I generally put my transmitter frequency at 5 ppm. So, offset on both side is 5 ppm, which corresponds to 2500 hertz on 500 megahertz NMR spectrometer. So, 500 into 5 is equal to 2500. Uh, this is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power 4 radian per second. So, 2 pi into 2500 is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power 4 radian per second. And for that, generally we apply 90 degree pulse of around 12 microsecond, of around 12 microsecond. In that case, omega will be your pi by 2 divided by your time of the pulse. Since, uh, so basically omega t is equal to theta and so omega is equal to theta by t omega is equal to theta by t. So, theta is pi by 2 and t is your 12 into 10 to the power minus 6. So, which is around 1.3 into 10 to the power 5 radian per second. So, 12 microsecond pulse is so chosen such that RF field is about 8 times the offset. So, offset is look offset is here 1.6 into 10 to the power 4 radian per second whereas omega 1 chosen is 1.3 into 10 to the power 5 radian per second and so RF field which is proportional to omega 1 is about 8 times. So, 1.3 into 10 to the power 5 divided by 1.6 into 10 to the power 4 it is around 8 times 8 times. So, RF field is about 8 times the offset and so the pulse can be regarded as strong over the whole width of the spectrum, whole width of the spectrum. So, if you want this uh, pulse should be uh, taking care of all the offset, then you have to choose hard pulse which has a small, a small time which is around 12 microsecond 
and that kind of pulse is known as hard pulse that kind of pulse is hard pulse because it is affecting the resonance from 0 ppm to 10 ppm 0 ppm to 10 ppm and it is almost around you know it will vary from 90 degree to 80 degree okay for 90 degree to the resonance which is at 5 ppm and around 80 degree uh, to the uh, to the resonance which is at suppose 10 ppm. Uh, so we have to choose a hard pulse such that we can get maximum intensity out of the spectrum. Soft pulse are of higher uh, time, of higher uh, length, time length, and uh, they are chosen when want to uh, excite only one resonance, one specific resonance, then you choose the soft pulse uh, because soft pulse uh, RF field is uh, very small whereas for hard pulse RF field is quite large then offset and so they affect uh, whole width of the spectrum strongly. So, RF field is about 8 times the offset and so the pulse can be regarded as strong over whole width of the spectrum. So, you want that whole width of the spectrum should get affected as strongly as possible, as strongly means uh, the pulse your theta should be around pi by 2 uh, for a peaks at 10 ppm or 0 ppm. Uh, so, second important thing if you want to get maximum signal, so it is crucial to use correct flip angles in NMR experiments. You must remember that NMR is low sensitive technique. So, we want to get maximum signal from each scan and so it is crucial to use correct flip angle and to obtain maximum intensity we must use a 90 degree pulse and to invert magnetization we must use a 180 degree pulse and so correct length of pulse should be maintained and therefore pulse calibration is an important preliminary to any experiment. So before starting any experiment you must do pulse calibration because if you are not using exact 90 degree pulse you are going to get a small signal. And the way we do is that uh, uh, we start doing uh, taking a spectra uh, by varying the your varying the time, varying the time, time of the pulse, varying the time of the pulse. So, for example, we start from four microsecond to suppose 48 microsecond okay and then get the intensity get the intensity so initially when it is around 0 degree pulse the time corresponding to 0 degree pulse you will get no signal but uh, as you uh, as the time increases your intensity will increase and at 90 degree pulse you should get maximum signal that is what you expect at 180 degree you should get 0 signal and again 360 you should get a 0 signal. So, what you do that at a particular you apply so for example you apply at 4 microsecond then 5, 6, 7, 8 till 48 microsecond and then try to see a null condition. Suppose we find a null condition at 24.4 microsecond corresponding to pi pulse, uh, then uh, the pi by 2 pulse will be 12.2 microsecond and that should be chosen to get the maximum intensity. So, what in the calibration what you are doing is you are applying, uh, you are applying pulse of different time length, pulse of different time length 
and trying to find out a null condition. And as you know that null condition can be found at 180 degree, 360 degree. So once you know that, that this is the time length which corresponds to, which corresponds to your uh, null condition, then you know where is 180 degree, where is 360 degree. And once you know time corresponding to 180 degree, uh, you just divide by 2 and then you get the pulse length for 90 degree pulse, pulse length for a 90 degree uh, pulse. So if we find a null condition 24.4 microsecond, it means 90 degree uh, pulse length should be 12.2 microsecond. Now let us go to how to process the data, how to process the data, NMR data, it is very important and again because this is related to enhancing the signal and resolution. So after you get your FID, you need to process the data before doing Fourier transformation. So uh, what you can do is, for example, look uh, that we are looking at we are trying to look at the signal either in x direction or y direction. Suppose we are looking at x direction and if uh, uh, then you are, I told you that you can get signal at x, you can get signal at y, one will be your x signal will be your cos modulated whereas y signal will be sin modulated. So that is what you get. So signal if at x versus time will look like this, signal at y versus time is will look like this because this is sin modulated, this is cos modulated and when you do Fourier transformation, this will give you a real signal and uh, this one will give you imaginary signal, imaginary signal. But suppose uh, our spectra is or our signal is making or uh, suppose our 90 degree pulse is not uh, exactly 90 degrees. So, what we will get is signal uh, which has a phase, signal which has a phase with the x and y axis. In that case, you your signal will not exactly like this one and this one, it will have slight phase shift. and your real image will look like this, your imaginary will look like this, imaginary part will look like this. So Fourier transformation of this signal will look like this and Fourier transformation of this signal will look like this. And in terms of your signal, it is basically uh, the signal which uh, we expect multiplied by exponential i phi if this angle, this signal makes phi angle with the signal in x axis. Now first thing you need to do is you have to do phase correction for this and it is not very difficult to understand what we need to do is we need to multiply the whole signal by exponential i phi correction. So what do you do that you multiply your signal by this factor and when this phi corrected is equal to minus phi is equal to minus phi you will get a signal which has been phase corrected. So look at this uh, you know if there is 90 degree uh, the phase uh, this phi value then what you will get? This will become kind of sin modulated, this will become kind of cos modulated and then Fourier transformation of this will give look like dispersion and Fourier transformation of this signal will look like an imaginary, uh, 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 the imaginary part will look like your absorption. And if you have a phi is equal to 180 degree then real and imaginary will look like this. So, only thing is that the way we do phase correction is uh, that you multiply it by a correction factor which is equal to exponential i phi uh, correct and when you do that then you can see the change in the shape of the real and imaginary part 
real and imaginary part and when this phi is equal to for example, in this case phi is equal to uh, the 90 degree then minus 90 degree then what you will get is uh, this exponential i phi correct into exponential i phi will be equal to 1 it will be equal to 1 and or uh, will be equal to 1 and then your exponential i phi correct minus phi this will be equal to 0 and so exponential 0 is 1 and so your signal is now phase corrected. So, this is the way you do phase correction and this is called first order phase correction. You also need to do second order phase correction sometime what happens that uh, if you look at the Fourier transformation you will get your signal at the last part of the spectrum in one end of the spectrum uh, like this and to other part it will look like this, it will look like this. So, um, so if you notice here, this here, uh, notice here that phase changes are totally in different direction to the two ends of the spectrum, two ends of the spectrum and uh, for that you cannot multiply by a constant exponential phase function you have to multiply something like this multiply phase something like this and when you do that that is called second order phase correction so here is the negative part here is the positive part so since here the phase is positive phase is positive and here phase is negative. So, positive part is multiplied by negative whereas, negative part is multiplied by positive. So, that now effective effect is uh, uh, so basically the correction is done at this at phase phi is equal to 0 you see there is no correction needed phi is equal to uh, for this resonance no correction is needed for this resonance no correction is needed. So, this is the way you do second order phase correction and as I discussed in the uh, initial lectures that uh, NMR is low sensitive technique and so we need to find a method to increase the intensity or signal to noise ratio and the way we do is uh, increase the concentration of analyte. Uh, so, it is not possible every time. So, second way is to increase the number of a scan, increase the number of a scan, collect the data in time domain mode and do Fourier transformation. These are the some of the way in which you can improve the signal to noise ratio. If I take any scan, uh, then signal will increase to n times after n summed scans. Noise being random will contribute sometime positively, sometime negatively to the total noise and so accumulation will be less rapid by root n times. So, if I take n scans then signal to noise ratio gain by root n times. So, this we have already discussed. So, this is before acquiring the signal. Now, what we need to do is we can also do sensitivity enhancement when we are processing the data. So, these things need to be kept in mind when you are processing NMR signal and you are processing NMR signal. So, here is the three cases here you see FID has been collected for longer time uh, when and here the FID collected for less time. If I do Fourier transformation of this spectrum, this FID, I will get signal like this and if I Fourier transform this spectrum, we will get signal like this. So, if you look at this, there is more noise whereas, here is less noise. So, if you look at uh, this NMR spectrum, what you will see that this part is quite long, 
this part is quite long what does that mean is uh, basically you are collecting more noise because if you notice that signal is mostly contained in very small part or uh, what you say that all the signal is contained in early part of the FID. So, sorting the acquisition time will improve the signal to noise ratio. So, there is no need to collect all uh, this FID because the later part does not give any information. It uh, basically increases the noise in the sample, increases the noise in the signal. And so, if I want to improve the signal to noise ratio, then I need to sort in the acquisition time, which is basically time spent in recording the signal. So, this is one of the way uh, for sensitivity enhancement. Now, we know that signal is strongest at the start and as that time progresses, the signal decays and gets weaker, whereas noise remains at the same level. So, there are another thing which ca we can do for increasing the SNR or signal to noise ratio that we should give more weightage to initial part of the FID. And so, and uh, the way we can do is it that we multiply by a function which strongly decay with time, strongly decay with time. So, these functions are called window functions and uh, for sensitivity enhancement we should use a window function which is strongly decay function. What it does it is that it will give more weightage to initial part of the FID and very less weightage to the later part of the FID. And one of such function is exponential function and the window function for that is exponential minus r l b into t, exponential minus r l b into t. So, when you multiply by this window function, what it does is given in this scheme. So, this is the original FID. If I multiply by this function, what will it do? That you see this function after this part is 0. So, if you multiply after this, it will become 0. And again, weighing is weight of this. So, suppose this is 5 and this is 5. So, basically multiply, if you multiply this, it will be 25. And if suppose you are here and here suppose signal is around 0 0.5 and suppose here this one is 0 0.5. So, 0 0.5 multiplied by 0 0.5 and so that can be given by 0.25. So, you see 5 is going to 25 whereas, 0 0.5 going to 0.25. So, 5, 5 is getting enhanced where 0 0.5 is getting reduced. And so, what you basically did is that you gave more weightage to initial signals, whereas you are giving less weightage to your the signal at the end. And if you do that, you will get this signal and your, so, so weightage FID will be, if you multiply this by this, you will get this, this is weighted FID and now you can see that how does this look like. Here almost all noise is 0. 0. And when you do your F, uh, Fourier transformation of this FID, you will get a very nice looking peak, you will get a very nice looking peak which has a less noise, which has less noise. So, in mathematic sense what you are doing is, you are multiplying this signal by weighing function and this is your weighing function and this is your signal. When you do that, then S naught into exponential epsilon t uh, exponential minus r l b plus r 2 into t. So, what you are able to do is, now your decay will going to be not only by r 2, it will be sum of r l b plus r 2 
so signal will decay very fast signal will decay very fast so initially your signal decay by rate constant r2 whereas now when you applied the weighing function now signal is decaying by rlb plus r2 and thus it leads to the signal to noise enhancement now you are able to enhance the signal you are able to enhance the signal but that has a problem that basically compromises with the resolution and now i will explain how so this is your fid which is decaying slow and this is fid which is decaying faster than the first fid and this decay very fast if you do fourier transformation you will get a very sharp line for fid which is decaying slow whereas a fast fourier transformation of fast decaying fid will give a, a broad peak and that i have already explained in, in my initial lecture why that happens and that has to do with heisenberg uncertainty principle so the a broad peak is obtained for fast decaying fid whereas a sharp peak is obtained for slow decaying fid so for enhancement of signal to noise ratio what we did that we made our uh, fid our fid uh, a fast decaying but that leads to broadening of peak so sensitivity and resolution go in opposite way so if i increase the sensitivity then resolution get lost and when i increase the resolution your sensitivity get lost a fast decaying fid has a less resolution so now question is if suppose i want to do resolution enhancement uh, what we need to do we know that a weighing function designed to improve the snr has since the decay of signal thus leading to broadening of line so for increasing the resolution we need to multiply our signal by a weighing, uh, weighing function which exponentially increase which exponentially increase and thus delay the decay of the signal and for that we use this weighing function and now you can see this is exponentially increasing weighing function so weighing function is equal to exponential of plus r re into t where re is greater than 0 so now we looked at how to increase the signal to noise ratio how to increase the resolution but uh, if you apply a uh, window function which increases in snr it leads to your decrease in resolution so we need to find out an optimum where we can have best of both for that people design several different thing one of the function which has been designed is uh, gaussian function where uh, weighing function is exponential minus alpha t square it is not exponential minus alpha t it is exponential minus alpha t square uh, let's look at this here is your fid and its fourier transformation if i multiply by this function which is exponentially increasing function then fid will look like this and its fourier transformation will give this kind of peak here signal to noise ratio is bad but resolution is better more sharp, sharp peak compared to this one but you can see that here resolution increases but snr decreases so another way is to multiply by this function and then multiply by this function so one is increasing and another is your decreasing function and that looks like here so initially it is so initial part as uh, it is increasing where later part it is decreasing and what it does is 
that uh, it gives you this kind of FID and uh, that leads to this kind of frequency domain signal. So, here you have got an optimum level of optimum level of the signal and resolution signal and resolution. So, this kind of things you need to keep in mind when you are trying to process your data. For example, if your peaks are uh, quite separate, quite separate in that case you need maximum intensity and so you apply a window function which gives you maximum sensitivity. If uh, you can take higher concentration of the substance and peaks are quite nearby to each other, in that case it is easier to get signal to noise ratio, but you need a better resolution. In that case you apply a window function which enhances the resolution. But if suppose our spectra needs both sensitivity and resolution enhancement, then you need to multiply by weighing function which has this kind of feature. Uh, uh, so, to get an optimum uh, your window function, sometimes people use sine bell function. Sine bell function can be of different type. Here is 0 degree sine bell function with 0 phase, whereas this is sine bell function with, with pi by 8 phase, this is with pi by 4 phase and this is with pi by 2 phase. And again this can be applied keeping our keeping our uh, our uh, use in mind keeping our use in mind. So, for example, here this kind of function 90 degree phase shifted sine well function is needed when we want to uh, get we want to get higher intensity higher signal to noise ratio. Whereas, this kind of function will be used if we want to take both uh, signal to noise and resolution uh, to uh, optimum. If we want optimum signal to noise ratio and uh, uh, signal to noise ratio and resolution, then we uh, apply pi by 4 shifted sine well wave function. Sometimes we also apply sine bell square function and the shape looks like this. So, I hope now you understand how to apply the window function. It is very important uh, because it, it will give a, it can uh, affect your spectra. Uh, you can get uh, your better resolution or we can get better signal to noise ratio. The another thing which uh, is important in processing of NMR data is what is known as zero filling. So, if suppose I take your NMR data for this many time uh, for this acquisition period. So, basically you are taking these many data. If I take time acquisition and keep your number of data same, then you will get more number of data at uh, this point. And if your T acquisition is small and then you can get more number of data in this region. So, what zero filling does is that if you look at here the FID along the top row has been supplemented with increasing number of zero. So, contain more and more data point. So, here you can uh, take a more number of 0 and uh, thus you can have more and more data point. So, Fourier transformation preserves the number of data points. So, the line in the spectrum is represented by more points as 0 are added to the end of the F FID. So, if you take NMR spectra for this much time only and then add 0 then basically you are taking more number of data point in this period, more number of data point in this period uh, and uh, which leads to more number of data in 
in your peak. So, in this FID remains the same for all three cases, no extra data has been acquired. So, this is about processing of data. So, three important things we discussed how to correct the phase. The second thing we did how to improve the signal to noise ratio, how to improve the uh, resolution and if we want optim optimum uh, resolution or optimum signal to noise ratio then which kind of window function we need to use and last uh, is your uh, uh, zero filling. Last is your zero filling and I told you what is the importance of this. Now, NMR spectrum has chemical shift. So, if we are suppose uh, you know you are applying your pulse at a particular ppm. So, all proton will be excited. Now, question is uh, if all protons are ex excited whether chemical shift is going to be same. So, it is not so because every nucleus is associated with circulating electron and circulating electrons create a local magnetic field opposite to the direction of external magnetic field. Thus, a nuclei experience a smaller field than external magnetic field. In other words, spins are shielded from the external magnetic field. So, generally what you expect that nu is equal to 1 by 2 pi gamma b naught, but uh, what happens because every nucleus is associated with circulating electrons. So, uh, these electrons will create a local magnetic field d e opposite to the direction of external magnetic field. So, what you are looking at is uh, this frequency. Okay? So, spins are shielded from the external magnetic field by this uh, your magnetic field. And so, nu will be different for different nucleus since B will be different, since B will be different for each nucleus. Shielding is proportional to external magnetic field. So, so shielding is not constant, it also depends on external magnetic field and B is given by sigma into B naught and then frequency is 1 by 2 pi, this gyromagnetic ratio uh, multiplied by B naught minus sigma B naught where sigma is called shielding constant and depends on the structure of the molecule. And since sigma is different and so different protons or protons in different you know environment uh, will you know resonate at different frequency and that can be used for the getting information about the structure of the molecule. So, chemical shift uh, what uh, we come to know is frequency of absorption for two protons will not be same. It is important to note that frequency of the absorption will be different for same spin at NMR frequency instruments with different magnetic strength since delta E depends on B. So, one another thing which need to be keep in mind that frequency of absorption is going to be different for same spin. When if you are looking at one spin, the frequency will be uh, frequency absorption will be different for that spin at NMR instruments with different magnetic field. For example, frequency will be different at 400 megahertz NMR machine and frequency of that same proton will be different at 600 megahertz NMR machine since delta E depends on B and delta E will increase if I increase B and so nu will be going to be greater. For example, if frequency of two protons uh, lines at 400.0004 at uh, 400.008 megahertz. So, if suppose two protons are there, one resonate at 400.004 and another resonate at 400.008 megahertz in 400 megahertz NMR machine, then these two lines will appear at 600.006 megahertz 
and 600.0012 uh, megahertz in a 600 megahertz NMR. So, is the spin which resonate at 400.0004 at in a 400 megahertz machine will now resonate at 600.0006 megahertz in 600, uh, 600 megahertz NMR machine. It is simple because in 400 megahertz machine this gap will be smaller and then 600 megahertz NMR machine since this gap is now bigger and so new in 600 will be greater than new at 400 megahertz NMR machine. So, the separation between two lines is 400 hertz on 400 megahertz machine and 600 hertz on 600 megahertz machine. So, this signal is two resonances and the difference between these two is 400 hertz in 400 megahertz machine whereas, 600 hertz on 600 megahertz machine exactly proportional to the magnetic field strength exactly proportional to magnetic field strength. So, to keep the position of peaks same on two NMR machine what we need to do? We need to uh, normalize the position in NMR peaks. So, what we can do is we can simply divide this by nu. So, just keep this thing uh, you see the normalized shift let us write normalized shift is given by nu by nu ref nu by nu ref. So, if we do that then we will get one value. So, let us do it when we do that then uh, normalization ensures that a peak which is at 400.0004 hertz at 400 megahertz machine and uh, 600.0006 in 600 megahertz machine will appear at the value 1.000001 value 1.000001 frequency of a proton line at 400 point this will appear at 1.000002 and so you see the difference between these two is very small 0.000001 hertz or uh, not hertz it is unitless. So, 1 point uh, so 0 0.000001 hertz. So, difference in proton signal is very uh, small and not convenient to express and thus what we do is uh, the position in NMR peak is not expressed in terms of frequency wavelength wave number, but in terms of chemical shift and chemical shift is given by this value nu minus nu ref divided by nu of the reference material into 10 to the power 6. Nu ref is because nu of reference material into 10 to the power 6. Now, if we calculate spin 1 position in 400 megahertz machine, this is this minus 400.0000 divided by 400 and this will be 0 0.004 divided by 400 and if I multiply by 10 power, power 6 I will get 1 ppm I will get 1 ppm and so this value is convenient to express and that is why your in the NMR spectrum we take x axis in ppm not in hertz as we do for other spectroscopy. So, first thing is that here the frequency is dependent on frequency is dependent on your uh, frequency is dependent on um, external magnetic field and that is why it needs to be normalized. Again the difference is very small difference is very small and so we need to uh, get our uh, x axis in terms of a number which is easier to express and that is why chemical shift has been devised, the scale of chemical shift has been devised.
there are a lot of factors which affect the chemical shift, few of them I am going to discuss in this. Uh, the first factor is electronegativity. The surrounding electron density of proton shields the nucleus from external magnetic field. Electron withdrawing substituent when attached to the same or an adjacent carbon desilled proton and resonance occurs at lower field or higher chemical shift or higher chemical shift. So, this is one thing which you need to remember that electron withdrawing substituent desilts proton and resonance occur at lower field or higher chemical shift value. So, you see here this is F, this is C, L, B, R, C, L, uh, this is oh, I, this is I. So, C S 3 I, C S 3 R and when electronegativity increases what is means that it is draws electron from carbon and just desists this hydrogen and chemical shift is at higher position or lower field, higher position, higher chemical shift value or uh, lower field. Chloride 3.0 to 4.0, if chloride is attached to C S 3, proton will resonate between 3.0 to 4.0. If carbon is attached to bromine, these protons will resonate between 2.5 to 4.0 and similar is the case here you see R is your alkyl group in that case your chemical shift value is going to be small. So, electronegativity is a factor which plays a role. The second factor is mesomeric effect. So, here you see this is your hydrogen attached to a double bond, its chemical shift is 5.29, chemical shift is 5.29 and when it is in uh, resonance or mesomeric effect with the C double bond O, then its chemical shift value increases and if the you see, so what it does, it is taking away electron from this hydrogen hydrogen and that is why chemical shift is increasing. When the conjugation is in such a way that electrons is moving towards hydrogen in that uh, thing your uh, chemical shift will be in that case your chemical shift will be smaller. For substituted rings again same way you can think of. So, a proton which is attached here it comes at 6.55 because this electron is getting donated and the effect will be more at this position and at ortho position or para position uh, if you take mesomeric effect into account. And so, this two protons has a smaller chemical shift than this uh, proton at meta position. Same thing you can uh, see when the substituent group is OME or OCS3. Uh, if I have CS3 which is electron donating group and then you can see that uh, this value if you compare between this and this, this value is higher. NO2 is electron withdrawing group and now you see that this one has 8.21, this is 7.55, this is chemical shift 8.21, 7.55 and 7.70. Electron withdrawing group uh, affects uh, your this ortho position more compared to meta position and para position. The higher value of chemical shift will be for ortho and para whereas, for this uh, meta the effect will be lowest and so its chemical shift is smallest, uh, chemical shift is smaller. So, today I will stop here, uh, we will see the effect of, we will see the effect of uh, other factors on chemical shift in the next lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>